Welcome to Stay Grounded with your host, me, Raj Jana. I'm the founder of Java Press Coffee Company, and my life changed after my mentor died with three months left until retirement. That experience inspired me to start a personal journey to discover how we can all live a purpose-driven and meaningful life starting today. I interview everyone from best-selling authors and business moguls to extreme athletes and monks to discuss happiness, success, and fulfillment to uncover powerful takeaways that empower you to stay grounded and make passionate living a reality. To access post-podcast discussions, insights, and further resources, visit rajjana.com forward slash stay grounded. So thanks for joining me today. Now, let's get to grinding. Hello and welcome back to Stay Grounded. Hope you guys are having a great day. Man, this week's guest is also in line with the theme of love, and it is Mr. Ron Baker. But it's not the type of love that we discussed on last week's episode with Marla around relationships. This one is actually around the relationship you have with yourself and the transformative power that comes from loving every bit of yourself. So Ron Baker, just to give you some context, is a self-mastery coach, a speaker, an author, and a bioenergetics healing practitioner. He's actually someone that I go to for emotional guidance and wisdom. And when I first met Ron, what really drew me to him was actually the way he was explaining this concept of an inner child. And it was super awesome. We were at this uh, retreat and I had just gotten out of a session and I step outside and I see Ron sitting on a patio with about 10 people surrounding him. And everybody was glued in. They did not look anywhere. They weren't trying to do anything else. They were just listening to the man speak about the different layers of your inner child and what happens when you choose to either indulge it or just put it to the side. So what is the inner child? The inner child is the part of you that's wounded, hurt, and fearful because of the way you were brought up. Now, we're all carrying wounds from the past, and it's not always our parents' fault, but as Ron explains in the episode, it's likely that they didn't know how to raise us correctly. And I don't think it's any parent's fault in general. I think consciousness and a lot of awareness around what it means to be a great parent grows over time, but that doesn't change the part that there's a lot of wisdom that comes from just taking care of the child that felt like it was hurt. And so today on this episode, we talk a lot about what your inner child is, how to remove the blocks that are holding yourself back from either experiencing love, experiencing success in business, and removing the things that'll lead to insane growth, faster opportunities, and overall fulfillment. So I loved this episode so much, and I love Ron in general, just because this isn't a topic that is talked about enough. You know, when I first started in business, I was constantly just pushing, 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 looking for tactics, 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 tactics. What's the next marketing thing? What's the next uh, team building thing? What do I need to do? But what I didn't realize that every single problem I was facing in my business, in my relationship, in my life was stemming from a common denominator, which is the relationship with myself. And the second you start to understand the things that are stopping you from reaching your full potential, the second you start to heal those old wounds and, and, and things that your inner child craves, the faster you can actually start to make decisions and move forward with a new zest for life that doesn't have all of that baggage you're carrying with you. Now, whether you believe you're carrying baggage or not, well, that's for you to decide after listening to this episode. But I know that when I, when I finished recording this with Ron, I had a lot of emotions come up and I had to actually sit down and really process them. So I hope that this episode inspires a journey or it helps the journey if you're already on it to really understand, heal, and love who you are exactly as you are so that you can go out and create the world that you've always wanted to create and be the person in the world that you've always wanted to be in. So hope you guys enjoy this episode with Ron. If you haven't already, please go to iTunes and subscribe to us. All that means is that every single time we launch a new episode, this arrives in your inbox and join the Stay Grounded community through email and Facebook. You can go to rajjana.com forward slash stay grounded. And let me know what you like and don't like about this episode, because I'm telling you, Ron is one of my favorite people. He is a mentor of mine, and uh, I do admire him a ton, and I hope you guys do, too. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Ron Baker. Enjoy. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back (laughs) to another episode of Stay Grounded. Man, I am, I'm, I'm really, 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 really excited to be talking to this today's guest, Mr. Ron Baker. Uh, how are you, my friend? 
I am doing great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Every single time I feel like I'm around you or I talk to you, I just, I get planted in another world. And <laughs> like my mind is just consciously like upgraded. And then I, and then I have a whole <laughs> plan to look at the world through. So for this conversation to be happening in this medium where I get to ask questions that I've always wanted is like my dream come true right now. So how cool. Yeah. Thank you for making my day. Yeah. I'm so glad to be here. I uh, enjoyed meeting you this last year and I have, great respect for this gorgeous heart and enthusiasm you bring to everything you do. So I love the meeting of the minds. Oh man. Well, the minds are going to meet for sure. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I'll dive right into it because I already introduced you to our lovely listeners. So Ron, I remember the first time I met you, we talked a lot about healing your inner child. We talked a lot about sort of the, the way that we navigate our world now and how much of it comes back to this child within us. Can you tell me, for one, why do you think everything we do is based on this inner child? And what role does this inner child play in our day-to-day -day activities? Well, let me explain for a lot of people what I consider the inner child so that it doesn't just end up being this amorphous term that people can't relate to. I think that everything in our lives starts with self, getting to know self, developing self, being in touch with what is important to you as an individual, et cetera, et cetera. From the beginning of our lives, this has been true. At the beginning, we needed to have certain nurturing needs that gave us a trust in the value of self. And I have taught thousands of people around the world, and I have never met anyone who ended up affirming that they got these nine levels of nurturing so that they end up with a real connection to self and a trust of self that continues to grow constantly, trusting that their lives can get better and better and better, and that they have this inner connection. So I like to say, well, I, I like to create a map of self to begin with that we all have three levels of potential. If you just imagine a target like an archer's target with concentric circles, the inner circle is where we hold the potential for the wonder of child consciousness. Hmm. Then we move out to the empowerment of adult consciousness. And then the outer ring is the greatness of soul consciousness. However, most people move through their lives and they are never connected into the true potential of any of those because we didn't get the nurturing education about self and the nurturing investment in self when we were little. Yeah. Well, this is perfect. It's not a problem. It sets up our curriculum for our lifetime. And when we don't get the nurturing, I'm finally getting to the inner child. When we didn't get the nurturing, we end up with impressions of fear, shame, and judgment. And that becomes frozen and hidden and protected, and we defend it and we compensate for it. And all of those frozen parts of self are what I refer to as the wounded inner child. And in order to blossom, we have to get back in touch with that and learn how to offer these nine levels of nurturing. A lot of times it's pretty painful to go back into those places. How does one change their relationship with that pain or not even that pain, maybe that, that suffering that they might have had at some point in their life? I love that you're pointing it out through those two words. A lot of people are afraid to look inside because they're afraid they're going to open up pain and suffering. And I'm telling you right now, not one of my clients in 27 years has found that to be so, that they end up creating more pain or suffering by going back. You see, what creates pain is resistance. Mm. So as a child, when we aren't nurtured to claim our feelings and feel our feelings and express our feelings, then we go into resistance, which creates friction. Right. And we associate the pain of that resistance to the feeling. And so we go, oh, to feel sad is very painful. And it's actually not painful at all. 
if we're actually feeling and nurturing and sharing and releasing, it's pleasurable to feel all our feelings. And people find that really hard to believe because we haven't had models that knew how to teach us to do that. And so most people are very ruled by the feelings they want to avoid. I have to avoid not good enough. I have to avoid failure. I have to avoid criticism or not good enough. And I teach my clients how to get in touch with all of their feelings, including those, not situations, just the feelings. And they find out that there is no pain in reconnecting and holding a space for the child part of self that we wish mommy and daddy had known how to do. Mm. So we go inside and we move the energy and we release the fear, shame, and judgment when we get back in touch with those feelings. I want to talk about failure because you brought up a really interesting point. You said not the act or the result of failure, more the feelings of failure. Yes. So talk to me more about that because that's a really interesting concept. To me, failure, it's not that me personally, it's not that I'm afraid of failure. I might be afraid of the way people perceive me when I fail. I mean, because that's rooted in so much survivalist like psychology that goes back hundreds of thousands of years to when we were cavemen <laughs> and being accepted. How does one even start to, to rewire something that seems so instinctual? Well, let's name some of the nurturing needs first, because you pointed out wanting to be accepted. So some of the nine nurturing needs are the need to experience safety, connection, affection, acceptance, acknowledgement, compassion. So those are six of the nine nurturing needs. We desire them. We search for them. We want them. And when we fail to get them, we experience the feeling of failure. So then we associate this disconnection and mommy, daddy are not loving me. And so it's how we're seen by mommy, daddy. So we associate some threat with failure. Mm. If we move out to the second ring that I talked about, which is adult consciousness, I can simply ask an adult reality question that says, do you know anybody who's ever created anything without a learning curve? Do you know anybody who's managed to go through life without failing at their first attempt at each thing? Yeah. Now think of three people that you love. Would you stop loving them because they make a mistake or they fail at something the first time or the first five times? We have a capacity to love in this way so that failure as an experience is not threatening. It's a part of the learning curve of growth and improvement. But because we have it associated with mommy, daddy, not loving me for who I am, for all of the parts of me, then we have it associated with pain and shame. Okay. In that, in that regards though, if let's say the love and the appreciation, and the acceptance I needed in my life was based on someone else failing to do their duty as a parent or someone else failing to do their yes. duty as how do you rewire that? Because now I feel like there's a part of me that wants to, wants to continue failing. But when I judge the people in my life who failed for not giving me the acceptance and encouragement I needed, it just seems like it's an endless cycle. Well, you see, you learned as a child to see it from both sides. I failed and they failed and therefore I'm miserable. So we have it associated with the pain. Whereas if we take that initial setup of our childhood and we bring it to adult and we say, okay, as an adult, I now realize that even if mommy and daddy had loved me fully in every way, given me all the nine nurturing needs, that is still not the end result. Somebody else loving me is only the first foundational level of love. The second level is I can love myself. I claim myself and then I can love others. And this is where we can heal it. When we look at failure as I am the only one who can fail me by not showing up for myself. I am the only one who perpetuates the fear by not showing up to this deeper truth. 
the truth that you were always intended. Let's just go back and say, Raj, I'm your mommy, daddy. I love you fully. I love everything. I hold a space for all your feelings. I acknowledge you and your learning curve and your failure. Now it's back to you. How do you feel about it? What are you experiencing? What do you value about yourself? How do you feel when you make a mistake? Can you love yourself through that natural process? Because that's how you learn and adjust and enhance and grow. So to bring somebody into the adult is super important in order to the challenge the wounded myths and misperceptions of a child. We didn't know we had those options when we were five. Yeah, it's almost like once you heal the inner child, it's almost like you're you have the strength to own almost like a responsibility for your self care. And, and would you see it as a responsibility or would you see it as a medicine? Would you see it as a vitamin? How do you sort of view self care in the grand scheme of things as a, as a ritual or a practice or even a religion? Well, I'll start out with an adult perspective of the word responsibility. People often consider the word that it's up to me. It's a burden. It's my responsibility to figure it out, to get to a solution, to be successful. Versus responsibility is nothing more than my ability to respond and improve. Hmm. So it is my responsibility that gives me the capability of making enhancements and recognizing, and I don't have to wait for mommy, daddy to eventually see my worth and value. I can go ahead and take my ability to respond, go inside and begin to look for the things I value about myself. And we all need tools and guidance in this process, by the way. We throw things out in quick conversations that last 45 minutes, and they are seeds we then need a process. Yeah. We need someone who has dedicated their life to exploring this and has the tools and has a process that can allow it to become a step-by-step -step nurturing reconnection to yourself. Mm. So if you want to go back to some of what you asked around responsibility, I'm happy to go in more directions, but that's my initial answer. I love responsibility. And I love how you reframe that as your ability to respond because that is empowering, period. That takes all of the burden out of the word altogether. Ron, how did you, like, when did you start to make these connections within yourself? Was there a period in time or a moment or an experience that sort of allowed you to just connect the dots all the way back to seeing that all this rooted from a place of, just from a single place? Well, if it's okay, I'm going to go back before I discovered to the motivation for finding the answers. When I was a kid, as an example, so that I share my humanity in this, my particular challenges, for instance, you just mentioned some around failure. I perceived myself, Raj, that I failed certain things and that my parents were failing at certain things. So my particular story boiled down to having a father who literally never said a single word to me growing up. He was there in the house for 13 years, and I cannot remember a single conversation. He certainly barked orders like, go mow the grass, that kind of thing, but not one time connecting to me. And then my family also went through some alcoholism for three years and then divorce. So those challenges sucked. And yet... Yeah. Now that I look back to my wounded child, I can offer a perspective as an adult that says, guess what? Those challenges put your specific focus on very distinct things that I needed to learn how to heal. And so I went searching for answers how to resolve these problems. So much of life didn't make sense. Why do we have these challenges? Well, when you face challenges, you actually deepen yourself. Let's make it simple. You go to first grade, you have the challenge of learning to read, to write, to deal with people, to be away from home. Those are challenges that allow you to respond, responsibility. You build your response ability and you deepen self. 
So as I faced my challenges and went to look for clear answers and deeper truths about life and how it works, I found profound teachers. I found the help that I needed. And as I began to apply the clues to myself and found out that when I learned how to look inward, when I learned how to nurture myself, when I learned how to move energy rather than being blocked and defended, when I learned how to reconnect to my feelings is when it made the biggest shift. And all of a sudden, all my clients say this as well. We resist it, we fight it, but every time we use your tools to go in and actually champion a feeling and release it, we feel so much better. And so from myself and from working with thousands of other people, it has become so clear the things that we all share and the nine nurturing needs that we seek throughout our lives, not just as children, and then that we need to learn to give to ourselves. So many layers. So I constantly make those connected dots. I constantly discover more and more ways to enhance it. I love that. I wouldn't want it to be some end result and then no more discovery and expansion. Why do you think there are so many ways to connect the dots? Because there are 7 billion different combos of individuals and somebody's going to respond more to a scientific approach. Somebody else is going to respond more to a nurturing approach. Somebody else to a particular archetype. There are so many needs that are unique and individual. And some people re will respond to me and what I have to offer. And other people are attracted to the five people to my left. And we can all serve one another if we learn how to get in touch with ourselves and to get really honest with ourselves about what does appeal to us and what we would like to try and what we have been afraid to consider, but then to follow through and ask for the support, nurturing and guidance, such as what I will be offering to your audience by the time we end this conversation. Thanks for that, by the way, Ron, because I think it's important to understand. And, and for me, more and more, I'm starting to realize that at times I'm actually sometimes my best teacher. Like if I listen to my body or if I listen to the way I feel or if I'm going through something and, you know, I have an instinctual response or a gut response, who do you think that teacher is? Because for me, it, it doesn't, it, these responses don't seem, they seem like they're me, they come from my body, but they might be coming from a different source. What, what is that source? Well, now go back to the map that I created. And we talked about a child, an adult, and then the soul self. That's your higher self. That is a very real part of all of us. But just like when you were six years old, if I had said to you, there's an adult inside you, it would have freaked you out as a six-year-old. You wouldn't know what that meant. How will I? What? 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 But now that you're an adult, you know that you're in the same body with the same organs and the same nervous system, and you're now an adult. The same is true for the soul. And the higher self is constantly present with clues and hints. Some people perceive it as an intuitive gut feeling. Other people are more clairaudient where they hear this little voice in the head that goes, you know, that's not going to serve you. You know, this would be wiser. And it's just literally as if you're talking to yourself. That higher self is a real part of us. But most of the time, if we're trapped in wounded consciousness, survival consciousness, we're so busy in the agendas and the compensations and the distractions and the gratifications that we don't get still enough to learn to listen. A lot of what I do is teach people how to get still and get connected to self so that they can trust themselves as the greatest teacher. Like I never tell people what to do. I teach them how to evaluate options and to get connected to themselves for what the wisest next move would be. Hmm. So well said. I, and I, I forgot you mentioned the third ring. My mind was kind of trapped in the, in the child and the adult, but you're so right. There is that third ring. Yep. When did you realize that third ring existed? I was one of those wacky ones 
who as a child was almost most comfortable in that higher life. I want to understand life. I want to understand how it works. I want to understand everything I can about that, which includes people. And then when I was about 11 or 12, I started saying things like, I feel like I'm being prepared for something. Those are all inklings of my higher self. The fact that each of us has a soul plan. So for instance, my initial wounding as a child around my father never speaking to me. I felt so invalidated and unlovable and alone and separate. So as an adult, I showed up and learned how to connect and nurture all of those things. And that taught me how to be a nurturing parent to myself. And then I reparented my wounded inner child. Mm. And that eventually led me to my highest life purpose, which is taking all of this out and being a nurturing father-like figure for thousands of people around the world. So my challenges literally seeded all three rings. Mm. It was a perfect setup. Whereas as a child, it totally sucked. As an adult, it was an opportunity to take response ability. And then my soul self loved that I was listening to the inklings and following into more and more and more of my potential. Did you start to see the external? This is starting to get really woo woo. But did you? Did you? Uh, uh, I, I live in woo woo, by the way. <laughs> so I, I love. I'm this. comfortable with woo woo. I am. I am very comfortable with woo woo. Now, did you feel like? When you started to connect these dots, did you start to see any of the external realities that you were facing start to align as well? Because I think that most people, and the reason I ask that is because I think most people don't trust, they don't trust that, you know, listening to themselves, like you guys, people say it all the time, you know, one of my favorite books is The Alchemist. And in The Alchemist, by, have you read The Alchemist, by the way? By I have, yeah. Yeah. And I remember when I was, that was one of my favorite books, just because he was, continuing to follow clues that just led him to where he needed to be in the end. It didn't feel right. It was sometimes hard. It was sometimes difficult, but the path took him somewhere he needed to be. How has that sort of come into your life? Well, facing the hard and the difficult is facing the challenges that are in the setup. So I like to call it your soul curriculum for a lifetime. Mine included among other things, the whole father issue and how will I ever be a man who's worthy and lovable. So that was part of my curriculum. And in order to get there, I had to face the challenges, learn to nurture and resolve them. And it changed everything in my outer life, including my relationship with my father. Mm. Eventually, when I got to my second ring of adult potential, I was like, wait a minute, you can resent and you can be sad for the rest of your life, but you're not seven anymore. You're now 27 and 37, et cetera. But when I was 27, I was like, wait a minute, half the responsibility for this relationship is now mine. So let me show up and respond. And so I phoned him and I said, dad, we're going to be in the same place. And I would love to sit down and have a conversation with you because I realize I don't know you at all. And I would really like to know you. Now, I had the courage to do that because I now knew myself more fully and I had begun to nurture me. And so I wasn't looking to him to be the result that determined whether I was safe, whether I was successful. I just said, I'm creating this opportunity for myself. and unfolded over the years in really incredible ways. I want to ask this because you just mentioned something about courage. You said Mm -hmm. that courage was built in yourself by just learning to accept and and forgive yourself. So do you think that fear can actually be abolished by just learning to love yourself? I'll tell you this. I know that fear can be resolved and released. You use the word abolished. I don't like words like that for myself because they sound combative. Yeah, They sound like I'm getting rid of it. And instead of getting rid of, when you nurture the feeling that you're afraid to feel. So for instance, I was afraid of feeling invalidated. 
So I would avoid it at all costs. I had fear of it. If I feel invalidated in this situation, it means this and this and this about being unlovable, et cetera. And it doesn't. Once I got to the adult place and I decided to go in and admit how I felt all those years, I was actually validating my inner child. He didn't have to experience only invalidation. You see, that's where the pain is. Oh my God, it'll be so painful. No, I was giving him the very thing he needed. He needed validation that he deserved to feel how he felt. And then once I felt the feeling and my child no longer was holding on to this fear of invalidation, but had a safe place to respond and get it out, then the fear was replaced with the new experience of nurturing. And if you do that consistently enough, you teach your nervous system that there is no fear in the feeling at all. And then you begin to move through life with more and more confidence even, not just courage, but confidence that you're not going to be threatened if somebody comes along. I I like to share it with my clients this way. If you're in second grade and some other second grader comes up to you and says, you are a meanie, this would be potentially very upsetting to you because you don't even know what it means. You just know that you're being accused and attacked and invalidated. And so then you take a 10th grader and a second grader comes up to the 10th grader and says, you are a meanie. The 10th grader is not threatened by the second grader. They go, oh, I see that you're caught and you're upset and how can I help you? Now just take that 10th grader up into adulthood and into our potential. We can go back and learn to be safe from a more mature place. But until we get in touch and move that and get it out, it's frozen as if we're still the second grader. Even if I'm 40, 50, 90, inside, it's buried in the dark, and we don't know that there's a much safer depth of potential. And so when you go in and you bring it out and you catch it up to 2018, that part of you finally gets the love and the nurturing, the acknowledgement, the acceptance, the connection, the affection that we needed the whole time. Oh, man. And so fear is literally released and you're free. You're only ever going to be as free as your capacity to feel your feelings. Nice. That is the truth. So many damn questions for you, Ron. Uh, <laughs> uh, but not enough for this conversation, but I... That, that resonated. And I, I think you went back to the idea of almost parenting yourself. Oh, yes. And, and it came back again for me. And so I, I love that idea of parenting yourself. If you could be a parent to yourself. How would you want to do it? And, and using that as a tool to nurture your way through fear. Now, I have a question. Does age matter in the experience of these emotional states? Like when someone's like, oh, you're mature for your age. Is that because these individuals, let's say an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old went through traumatic experiences and was forced to deal with them. And that created a sense of self-awareness and maturity. I guess, where did these old adages come from? And are they real? They are real to the perceiver, (laughs) but let's not leave it vague like that. Most of the time when someone says, wow, you're really mature for your age, what they are simply saying is, I have witnessed many people this age and you are more connected to yourself. You seem more confident. Now, this can either come from someone putting on the mask that I'm going to bury all of my wounding and I am able to conquer anything. And the way I'm going to protect myself is not to admit that I have any challenges. And I'm just going to put on a happy face and a confident face. Well, I happen to be someone who did all that. And therefore, people perceived me more mature for my age from a wounded place. Mm. Then we look at someone like my niece or any of my nieces and nephew. They've grown up around this more fully. They are more in touch with their emotional body. They share. They have a conversation about things more often. Of course, they still have challenges, but they are indeed 
more connected in an authentic maturity than the other people their ages much of the time. Yeah. No, it makes I guess it makes it does make sense. And I think it makes sense. I love the distinction between people who are saying these things from a place of a wounded warrior almost. Yep. If one doesn't know how to be a parent because they never had an example of how to be a, a good parent, how does one learn to be the parent they need for themselves? I guarantee you that most people don't know how to be a wonderful parent because the planet has only been at a certain level of evolution and didn't know about all of these nurturing needs, didn't know how to offer them. It's not that they didn't want to or they woke up this morning and said, I think I'll be an asshole today. They just literally didn't know. And so when my clients have a challenge with that, I say, okay, I need to build a jet engine. Teach me, go. And they don't know what to say. Uh, uh, There you go with parenting. Your parents didn't have all of the healthy modeling. Therefore, we're all learning together. We're growing in a collective learning curve. And so how does one do that? Well, again, it's helpful to go to people who have dedicated their lives to learning about a car engine when your car is having a problem. And it is helpful to go to people who've dedicated their lives to learning healthy, nurturing psychology, understanding the self. This is what I've dedicated my life to. And that's why people come to me all the time. We need help. And yet, I don't make people dependent on me. I don't want to be the new source that replaces mommy, daddy. I want to be a safe other adult that says, I'm happy to teach you what I have learned about all of this. And I want you to see how safe you are as an adult to receive. And so I'll ask someone at the end of their very first session with me, I said, I've only known you for one hour. Now you tell me in this hour, did you experience safety, connection, affection, acceptance, acknowledgement, compassion, clear guidance, support, and encouragement? And they go, absolutely. And I said, there you go. There's the nine nurturing needs, and this is only the first session. And then you literally learn to apply all those things to yourself, and you become a phenomenal parent with a learning curve for your own nervous system. And then once you've built that, then you can pass it on to your children and everyone else in your life. Now, I think that's easier to say if you know you need help, because, I mean, if you go to somebody and say, hey, you're not being a good parent, that's a very almost in a threatening way. It comes off as, you know, you're, it, it comes off as a different vibe, I guess. Like, how does one even know that they're not doing this right for themselves or how does one experience it before it's too late? Are you a good podcaster? Well, yes, you are. Have you gotten better since you started? Yes, you have. Will you get better over the next six months or a year? Yes, you will, if you're willing to pay attention and learn. Yeah. So why would I need to come and say to you my opinion about the level of your podcasting or the level of my ability as an interviewee? Why do we need to say, you're not being a very good parent? If someone is not being effective, They know it. Now, they may be numbing it out. They may be defensive about it. What the hell do you know? Well, that's just protection racket. But I don't need to approach anyone and say, you're not being a very good parent. I just say, where are you now? How can we enhance that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to get better? Do you want more pleasure and freedom and connection and intimacy? I know extremely safe, consistent ways for you to do that. I'm happy to offer you layers and specific tools for you to become a better and better and better parent in this particular case. Mm. That's a better way to explain it. Because you're right. If you want the answers, you'll seek it. And if you know the answers are there, you'll go after them. I think that's probably half the problem. They just don't know that these answers even exist. I think most people don't know that truly healthy alternatives exist because it's just 
now awakening over the last decade or two, and there are not tons and tons of places where you can get a truly profound series of layers and clarity. So you have to be discerning where you go for the help. Yeah. Ron, I had a question. So on that note, though, you know, there's so many things that I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that all of us are just learning and growing, right? Yep. And the only way to know about these things is to experience them in some capacity. Period. How do you accelerate that learning curve? You know, because I've, I've always been a big, big believer in the power of visualization and self-actualization. And if you don't know it exists, you can't visualize and actualize it. Nope. So for those who don't have the clarity already, how does one build that quickly? How does one go down that journey and illuminate the path, I guess, as quickly as possible? So we are an interesting society that thinks we need everything as quickly as possible. And we've gotten used to immediate gratification, particularly with the acceleration of technology. And we want something and we go, Siri, what's the deal? Here's the answer. Okay, did you actually have an experience and learn anything? Well, not necessarily. And it's a cool sound bite, but did it change who you are? No. And it makes us more and more dependent on things outside ourselves. Yeah. So people often ask me, how long is it going to take? And I go, how long is what going to take until I feel better? Oh, I said, better? You'll feel better after the first session. Do you want to stop with better? Or would you like to feel better and better and better dot, dot, dot? That is entirely possible. But how many people do you know who wake up every day going, I know how to enhance every part of my life, physical, mental, emotional, sexual, and spiritual. I know. I am aware of a process. I'm invested in myself. And I can enhance and bring that into every other arena of my life, into my career, my relationships, et cetera. So having clear, healthy tools that a person such as myself know are going to make a real difference. So for instance, I could say to you right now, do this tool or do this other tool. I already know what you're going to discover. This is what you want when you're looking for somewhere to tap in to improve your life. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to segue over to a couple of the free gifts that I want to offer everybody listening today, specific tools to do exactly what I just said, to go and explore some very simple but profound ways to connect to self, how to move energy, how to become much more trusting of your own value requires that you learn to look inward. However, if we weren't taught at the beginning to look inward, then we're still stuck looking out to mommy, daddy, and mommy, daddy replacements, even if that's looking to the boss at work or the money that I'm going to bring in as the thing that's going to validate me. But we have to slow down and learn how to connect to self because every single thing in your life is a reflection of the relationship you're having to you. So if you have this phenomenal opportunity in front of you, but you haven't built the confidence to take a step, you might miss the opportunity. If you're with someone with a capacity to love and value you, but you don't love and value you, you're not very likely to let it in or trust it. So if you go somewhere, such as to these free gifts that I'm offering at ronbaker.net, then you can give yourself some distinct initial tools. You'll be able to have a very clear contrasted experience from what is habitual to this new place that each of these tools will give you. And it will create a momentum of proving to your own nervous system through experience that better is indeed possible. Ron, do you journal? I did for a long time. Right. Now I write books, and so I don't have a whole lot of time and energy from that part of myself, but I'm constantly aware of myself and what I'm processing, what I'm working on, what I'm enhancing, et cetera. And that is internal journaling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On that note, how do you make synaptic connections between the things you're learning from a place of, of just internal introspection? 
you bring up the nervous system. So how do you create a synaptic connection? The synapses in our body, in our entire nervous system and brain, come out of whatever we are experiencing. So my constant invalidation from my father growing up caused my nervous system to not only fear that, but to expect that. Mm. And so it literally learned ways to invalidate myself before he would. All kinds of things create these synapses. I love that there's this new form of science called epigenetics that is starting to get in touch with the impact of the emotional body on the physical body. And it shows literal brains when you create a new experience, when you introduce nurturing and self-value, nurturing and self-value, nurturing and self-value, then you build the bridge that allows the nervous system to let go of the old way of connecting, and it literally forms new synaptic connections in the body. Mm. The cells do the same thing. The epigeneticists, big fancy word, have discovered that when a single cell is in an unsafe environment, it will thicken the walls of its self and the cell walls become defended energetically. You put the same cell in a healthy nurturing environment and that same cell is capable of releasing the protection and defense. And that is a little microcosmic example of exactly what I do with my clients. Did you do that with yourself? Absolutely. Otherwise, I couldn't do it with my clients. Yeah. The only way you can truly impact is to have built not only the knowledge, but the trust in the experience of something. And so when someone teaches from their head, because they just have some factoids, it doesn't touch you. But when someone teaches from a clear understanding and a trust of the experience, yeah. holy crap, the magic begins. How do you trust that the experience is going to be the same for someone else? <laughs> understanding human nature, number one, understanding that every single person seeks these nine nurturing needs more than any other thing throughout our lives, even if we numb it out, ain't nobody not wanting connection, affection, acceptance, etc. Now, I may have convinced myself with that mask of I'm invincible and I don't have any needs. That's just a protection racket. Underneath, we know that it's true. We all do want and need those things. The challenge is, is we're stuck looking outside ourselves for them, not understanding that you can't go from wounded child to a replacement from the outside. I'll explain that from an example from my own life. Before I did this career, I had a performing career and I did leading roles in Broadway and opera all over the world. And I got tons of validation and attention. I was signing autographs all the time. Do you think that validation actually healed and resolved my invalidation, fear, shame, and judgment? No. I was still trapped with it, assuming that I was duping all of these people, and I didn't know how to let the love in because I hadn't yet claimed responsibility as an adult to love myself. When I started doing that, the magic took over. Sounds like that's the golden ticket. It is the golden ticket, period. Taking responsibility for your sense of self. Yes. And getting some clear education and tools. That's the deal. Yep. 100% of my clients, distinct, consistent, forward moves, if they apply the tools. If you come and just get healthy information, doesn't do it. Only the new experience. New experience. Oh, that's a whole nother conversation that I'd love yeah. to go down the rabbit hole, maybe for another day. But <laughs> Ron, I wanted to uh, take a, just take a couple moments to say thank you for just opening up such a profound gateway, if you would, to just a look inside the soul, the mind, the spirit. And I just love how you connect everything. 
Like, I don't think that it's just, it seems like there's a beautiful place for everything in the way that you see all of this. And it's very clear, even with the way you just communicated all of it with me and, and our listeners. So just thank you. I'm grateful really for just taking the time to, to share all this. You are more than welcome. And please know to all of the people listening, I love conversation and having the opportunity to help you. And if you even just reach out from the website, ronbaker.net, I will happily respond to you and I'll use it on future podcasts from what I put out, which is called Empowered at Last with Ron Baker. I love that. I love that. I didn't know you had a podcast. All right. I'll yep. definitely check that out. That's amazing. Yep. I'll have to get uh, you on there. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to be there, man. So I have one last question for you, Ron. In the midst of everything you've been through, everything you currently go through, and just the peaks, the valleys of everything you've experienced in life, how do you stay grounded? Consistent nurturing, period. I make sure that I am aware and nurturing. Proactive nurturers is what I like to say that we're all becoming. My physical, emotional, mental, sexual, and spiritual self. And if I'm aware of all that and I nurture all that, then I feel safe even when I'm working through one of the challenges that's attempting to deepen one of those parts of me. So that is the clue. It truly is. But until you experience it, it will sound possibly too good to be true. I assure you, it is not. Mm. Hell of a way to end it off. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, this is Ron Baker. Ron, thank you again so much for being here. All right, guys, that is a wrap. For this week's episode of Stay Grounded, we'll make all of the resources Ron mentioned in the show available in the show notes and on the website. But until next time, I'm your friend Raj. This is your friend Ron. And from us, stay grounded. We'll talk all soon. the best. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of Stay Grounded. I hope you found this interview helpful as you create your own ways to live an extraordinary life. For more resources and support, please visit www.rajjana.com forward slash stay grounded to join the official Stay Grounded Facebook group, a place where aspiring life enthusiasts can connect and ignite passion for life together. My hope is that the positivity, content, resources, and support in this group will resonate with you on a deeper level. That what you hear in our podcast, read in our thoughtful posts, or learn in our courses will empower you to live with intention, uncover true purpose, and challenge the internal dialogues that stop you from being who you really want to be in your life. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Stay grounded.